Hi, I'm Dee Gao. I'm Senior Director of Research and Development at the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Welcome to the keynote plenary conversation on saving Chinatowns. Over the past year, I've been leading efforts at the National Trust to find ways that we can support historic Chinatowns through preservation as Chinatowns across the country continue to find themselves in a fight for their survival. Chinatowns have been bastions of community resilience for over 170 years, but today many of them find themselves facing a multitude of existential threats. And in the wake of these challenges, we wanted to explore what activism and preservation looks like in Chinatowns today. And I am honored to be joined by award-winning cookbook author, culinary historian, and fierce activist for Chinatowns across the country, Grace Young. Among her many accolades, Grace is a three-time James Beard Foundation Award winner and a six-time International Association for Culinary Professionals Award winner, including the 2021 Lifetime Achievement Award. She has authored numerous cookbooks and devoted much of her career to preserving the traditional iron wok, an endangered culinary tool that's traditionally used in Chinese cooking. Her family has donated cookware to the Smithsonian Museum as significant artifacts for Chinese American culinary history. Grace has been named the Poet Laureate of the Walk by food historian Betty Fussell, and recently dubbed the Accidental Voice for Chinatown by Grub Street for her advocacy for Chinatowns and AAPI small businesses across the country. And just this year, Grace received the Humanitarian of the Year Award from the James Beard Foundation and received the Julia Child Award at the Smithsonian. She's partnered with many nonprofits to raise money and elevate the profile of Chinatown's legacy businesses, and her activism has been widely chronicled. Before I interview Grace, she asked me to share a video to open up our conversation. This video is called Chinatown is in the Heart, produced by the Chinatown Community Development Center in San Francisco, along with Avocados and Coconuts Productions. Please take a look. Chinatown, it holds us together. That means the uh, responsibility to look after your parents as much as you look after your children. It's consideration for you know what went on before you as well as what will come after you. My father and my grandfather's generation built the railroads and do the laundries and dig the uh, gold mines. Everybody's aspiration was going to the gold mountain and get rich. I'm no exception, I guess. <laughs> A lot of the Chinese first came over as part of the gold rush. They saw that coming to San Francisco, you know, there was a chance to earn money and to get educated. There's a big part of me that's the Chinese American background that I have. Growing up there in Chinatown provided my parents with everything they needed to be successful and to raise a family. I've watched San Francisco change, and Chinatown is definitely different, but I think it still serves that purpose for helping immigrants adjust to American society. People here in America, you know, think Chinatown is very poor. As a kid, when people would go like, oh, where do you live? I didn't want to say I lived in Chinatown. And it wasn't up until high school that I became proud because I learned the history of what our community did to stay where we are today through hard-fought fights, it made me realize that I want to also do the same. I want to also 
advocate for my own community. Everybody that's come through Chinatown had a dream or has a dream. Maybe it's because that's what I've seen my entire life is watching my dad's generation, my grandparents' generation, just working really hard to have a better future for their next generations. This is an integrated living community where people want to live. It's not a museum. The importance of Chinatown is really to serve the immigrant population and to be there for the people who want to use it. We all love Chinatown so much that we would fight to like make sure we keep Chinatown and make sure Chinatown survives. Thank you so much to the CCDC and the production team for letting us show that powerful video. Grace, thank you for fighting for Chinatown and thank you so much for being with us today. It's my pleasure. It's a great honor to be here with you. This year's conference theme for our National Preservation Conference is From Vision to Action. And like many of us, I think you saw that Chinatowns were struggling and were in need, but you took action. Could you share your personal journey about what caused you to act? Absolutely. Um, I'm a Chinese cookbook author, so generally I'm in Chinatown two or three times a week to shop, to eat. And in January of 2020, I was stunned to see that Chinatown suddenly emptied out, and that is because of xenophobia and misinformation. Chinatown in New York City and across the country, Chinatowns were shunned. Um, and it was so painful to see that so many restaurants and shops lost 40, 60, and even 80% of their business. On March 15th of 2020, I went to Chinatown with videographer Dan On to interview restaurant and shop owners. And it was my idea that if New Yorkers could hear the personal stories of all the hardships that they had gone through in January and February and the start of March, that we could rally support and bring business into Chinatown. And the director of Poster House Museum, Julia Knight, had contacted me saying that she wanted to help Chinatown. And when I told her this idea, she said, if you do these videos, we will post them on the Poster House website. So that's how we ended up in Chinatown on Sunday, March 15th. Unbeknownst to us, that evening after we did the interviews, Mayor de Blasio put New York City in lockdown. So as we went into Chinatown to do these interviews, uh, we were not prepared for what we discovered. And that is that 70% of Chinatown restaurant owners had decided to um, closed the following day because business was so bad. And I think, Dee, you have uh, one of the videos that we can share with the audience. This was uh, an interview that we did at Hop Key, one of the oldest restaurants in Chinatown. And it's very short, this interview, but it's very powerful and moving because you see the tears in the eyes of the owner telling us that he has no choice but to close the following day. Let's take a look. My name is uh, Peter Lee. I'm the owner manager of Hopkey Restaurant here in New York City, 21 March Street. Uh, my 
father and his uh, partners opened up the restaurant back here in 1968. We're, we're a Chinese cuisine restaurant, famous for uh, our crabs and snails or our seafood. The coronavirus the crisis started here in January. It's gotten really slow in January, but as time progressed through February and now coming in March, business has dipped down even worse and I can say that I'm down pretty much from 50 to 70 percent. And in a given day, how many customers did you used to have? In well, at a given day, I would probably have about 40 to 50 covers per day at least. But now, I've been getting, I'll be fortunate to have 20 covers a day. And your uh, restaurant employees, how long have some of these been working for you? Uh, most of my employees have been working for me uh, for like uh, 10, 15, 20 years, a lot of years. Yeah, they're pretty much basically a family. And now you decide that tomorrow you're closing? Yes. There's no, um, I'm not happy about closing tomorrow. Well, the situation leaves well, a lot of people with no choice but to close up. So hopefully everything be well. So uh, generally when you go into Hop Key, there's a line out the door. That day when we arrived at Hop Key, there was only one table that was occupied. And as you saw, Peter brought us into the kitchen and I've been in many, many Chinese restaurant kitchens in my life. They're always the noisiest place in the world. And that kitchen was silent um, because there were no orders. And I will always remember the looks on the faces of the dishwashers, the cooks, the waiters. Um, nobody knew what was about to happen, but I think all of us knew that we were in trouble. And uh, the faces of all those workers still haunts me today. And many of the employees at Hop Key had been with Peter for 10, 20, 30 years. And I think doing these interviews and the video on Sunday, March 15th, right before Chinatown shut down on one of Chinatown's darkest days, uh, profoundly affected me and it inspired all the work that I ended up doing in the last two and a half years. Um, I realized that so many of those workers had no voice and that they had no way of getting their story out to the public. And so um, after uh, we did these videos and they're called Coronavirus Chinatown Stories and you can see more of the videos on the Poster House website, um, Mayor de Blasio put us into lockdown. And then in the latter part of March, April, May, I uh, made many walks into Chinatown with my husband and it was stunning because Chinatown looked like a Hollywood movie set of Chinatown. It was completely empty. Normally there's bumper to bumper traffic going down Mott Street. There were no cars, no pedestrians. Um, at that point, New York City was the epicenter of the pandemic. We had 700 to 800 deaths a day. And for the first time in my life, I saw the real possibility of losing Chinatown. Um, it, it was just, chilling and devastating to see Chinatown emptied out like that. And by the time we reopened in June, there were legacy businesses that did not reopen. And there was a little life in Chinatown, but nowhere's near what Chinatown normally feels like. In 2019, uh, New York City had 66 and a half million tourists and historic Chinatowns in San Francisco, New York, and Boston are dependent on tourism. In 2020, I would venture to guess that there were no tourists whatsoever. And not only did we lose the tourists, but we lost 
in Manhattan, lower Manhattan workers in San Francisco and Boston. They are adjacent to the financial district. All of those workers suddenly disappeared. So Chinatown was really struggling to survive. Uh, locals were afraid to come out for fear of catching COVID. Um, and I realized that even though I had never been an activist, that I had to do everything in my power. Um, I, I reached out to every contact that I knew and drew on every skill that I had. Because I'm a cookbook author, I had some contacts with the media. And so I uh, reached out to the local NPR station to do an interview to raise consciousness, that uh, raise public awareness that Chinatown needed our support. Um, I wrote articles for different magazines like Food and Wine. Media reached out to me, like the BBC or Today.com. Um, I ended up raising money with uh, a local grassroots organization called Welcome to Chinatown. Um, I raised over $40,000 to save legacy businesses in Chinatown because when we reopened, we lost so many legacy businesses, I was afraid there would be more hemorrhaging. Um, and those restaurants fed people in the community that were dealing with food insecurity, who were on low income or seniors. Um, we raised, I raised money to uh, provide personal security alarms for seniors and workers in Chinatown. Um, I started um, a Instagram campaign with the James Beard Foundation in 2020 to save Chinese restaurants. In 2021, it shifted to supporting AAPI, Asian American Pacific Islander mom and pop businesses across the country. Um, so I just tried to do everything in my power to try and lift Chinatown up. It sounds like you really drew on every connection and every tool you had access to and really leveraged your, your position. I want to back up a little bit for this audience and ask you what you love about Chinatown and what makes it so unique and why it's important to America that Chinatowns are saved. Well, um, Chinatown is a vibrant living community where every restaurant and store is one of a kind. And often I feel when I go to Chinatown, it transports me to another world. And there are moments I feel like I also take uh, a little trip back in time. And when I think about Chinatown, I think about some of my favorite places. I love to eat in Manhattan's Chinatown at Hop Lee, which is different than the video that you just saw of Hop Key. Um, but Hop Lee reminds me of the kinds of restaurants my father used to take me to. Um, I would describe it as Cantonese soul food. When you go there uh, in the daytime, uh, I love it when I see that all the Chinatown uh, postal workers have a table of their own. It's all about community, and uh, I call it sort of the cheers of Chinatown. It's a very special feeling being there. Um, in San Francisco's Chinatown, I'm very, very fond of the walk shop. Tain Chan opened this store over 50 years ago, and when you go into this store, it's mind-blowing. It's packed to the gills. It's a very tiny shop, but with all of these treasures, and they carry the old fashioned traditional cast iron Cantonese style walk. Um, and Tain Chan is in her eighties now. And during the pandemic, never missed a day of work. She went into that shop every single day. She reduced hours, but uh, she is a national treasure. Uh, here in Manhattan's Chinatown, we just had the mid autumn festival and there's a little Malaysian bakery called Quay Cafe, and I posted on Instagram, they sold mooncakes for one day, and they are works of art. They are so gorgeous and even more delicious to eat. So there are all these little specialty things that you can find in Chinatown and only in Chinatown. Um, 
I, I love the fact that um, I love the people of Chinatown, their work ethic. Um, whether you're in a restaurant or a store, most people work seven days a week, 10, 12, 14 hours. And during the pandemic, they showed even more grit and determination and dignity showing up when there was no business or during times when there was the threat of anti-Asian hate crimes. Chinatown is a place to celebrate history and tradition and culture and fabulous food. And I love that Chinatown is the story of America. I, for me, it represents one of the things that makes this country great. And it's about diversity and inclusiveness. Wow, thank you so much for that vivid picture of what's at stake and all that Chinatowns across the country have to offer. When we talk about saving Chinatowns, I think that can mean a lot of different things to different people. And there's kind of a philosophical question um, in the preservation field as well about what it means to preserve something. So I wanted to ask you, when you talk about saving Chinatowns, what aspects of Chinatown do you talk about preserving or saving? Well, um, I am always focused on the businesses. I know that there are so many different um, areas of Chinatown that are in need of help, but I feel as though if you don't save the businesses um, and, and having witnessed seeing, seeing the loss of the old businesses, I think that just opens the door to gentrification and redevelopment. Um, and right now in Chinatown, in the last months, there's a new pizza shop. There's uh, coffee shops, bubble tea, ice cream, uh, Korean fried chicken. And I wish them all well, but to me, they are not Chinatown. And if more of that happens, um, as Chinatown becomes gentrified, we will lose Chinatown. Um, I think one of the things that is so important about Chinatown are the mom and pop businesses. In Manhattan's Chinatown, 98% of the businesses are mom and pop. In San Francisco's Chinatown, there are 1,000 family owned businesses. And I don't know the stats for all the other Chinatowns in America, but they're all mom and pop. And I think that there was a time when mom and pop businesses were the backbone of America. And it's what made this country so special. And um, when you go to Chinatown, everything is done the old fashioned way. It's about people to people connections. It's about sometimes cash only businesses. But um, during the pandemic, I, you know, all of us heard about the fact that uh, online business has skyrocketed and Amazon is making more money than they ever made. And I think to myself that people, I understand that during the pandemic, we needed to do online business because it was safer and it was more convenient. But the idea of scrolling, clicking, and then the next day the box arrives versus going to Chinatown and supporting a little mom and pop business. I have never shopped at Fresh Direct or ordered groceries at Whole Foods and had it delivered to me. I love the experience of going to Chinatown and going to one store to buy something, you know, to buy my fish and another store to buy my produce. Uh, one of the stores that I love to buy my produce is 88 Natural on Mulberry Street. And it's run by a husband and wife who get there early in the morning to set up and work all day. and Roughly around three or four in the afternoon, their daughters arrive from school. And sometimes if you peek into a back room, you can see them doing their homework or they're eating a snack. And then when things get busy, they pop out and they help their, mo their mom and dad at the cash register or they're prepping vegetables. And then at the end of a long day, they all go home together and you want them to succeed. I want to support that business rather than Amazon to make sure that they make it. And every single one of those stores and businesses in Chinatown have a story that it's similar to that. 
And so I think when we are supporting mom and pop, um, our lives are richer. The experience of um, going to buy your groceries or eating in a restaurant where the waiter knows what you want even before you open your mouth because you've come in so many times and they know what you like is what makes our lives um, a fuller experience. And so I think that it's really important right now to have this consciousness that when we're saving Chinatowns, we're actually saving small town USA the way America used to be. You really highlight an important point. It's not just the businesses. These businesses are family institutions. They're cultural anchors and they serve such important roles for the community. Um, what do you say to people who kind of feel that the pandemic is over and things have relatively returned back to normal? Are there other issues? You, you started talking about gentrification, displacement, um, continued fallout from the pandemic. Are there other issues that um, you want to elevate and let people know about that Chinatowns are still um, are still struggling with at this point in time? Um, so everyone suffered during the pandemic, but Chinatowns suffered more. Um, as I mentioned that at the start of the pandemic in January and February, uh, businesses went down 40, 60, 80 percent, and that for historic Chinatowns like San Francisco, New York, and Boston that are dependent on tourism, there were no tourists in 2020. So, so many of um, the Chinatown businesses have dealt with mounting debt. Uh, there are certainly landlords that were lenient and negotiated a lower rent, but I've heard about, I've heard enough stories about the landlords who were tough, who were hounding their, um, their tenants for the rent, even when we were in lockdown and they knew that their tenants were not taking in any income at all. So um, the hardships that they have endured and not only the mounting debt, but um, no other businesses in America had to deal with anti-Asian hate crimes. And that's been a huge um, impact on Chinatown's survival. Right now in uh, New York's Chinatown, San Francisco, all Chinatowns across the country, uh, Chinatowns used to be open late into the night. Uh, in the old days in Manhattan's Chinatown, there were restaurants that were open until 4 a.m. But pre-pandemic, many restaurants were open until at least 1 a.m. Nowadays, many of the restaurants are closed at 7 or 8 o'clock in the evening because there's simply no business. And that is because locals are afraid to come out at night. During the daytime and this past summer, when the weather was warm, when you're in New York's Chinatown, it actually feels a little pre-pandemic. There's a vitality to it. Um, but in the old days, at after work, lots of Chinese Americans, Asian Americans would swing by Chinatown on their way home from work and pick up groceries or um, have a meal. And nowadays, because of safety issues, they go directly home. So there are the smaller markets in Manhattan's Chinatown that are closing at 4.30 or 5 o'clock. Um, there are a few restaurants that are open until 10 o'clock, but I think 10 o'clock is now the cutoff point. But most restaurants are closed by 8. And in the spring of this year, uh, in New York City, there was a small study that was done, and it revealed that 75% of Asian seniors are afraid to leave their homes. So this really impacts um, the business in Chinatown. Without people feeling comfortable and safe, it limits how, how much they're going to make, and they cannot survive if there's not dinner business. So it's really critical that everyone else come into Chinatown. Everyone, all businesses in America right now are dealing with supply chain issues and inflation. But in Chinatown, the impact of inflation is even more dramatic. Um, one restaurant owner told me pre-pandemic, the cost of cooking oil 
was $26 and now it's more than doubled. It's $59. The price of all foods have gone up, but on top of that, the energy bills have gone up by um, 100%. So pre-pandemic, they were paying four to $5,000 and he said, now he's paying nearly $10,000. When you think about Chinatown, most people expect inexpensive meals. So um, there is a restaurant in Chinatown that pre-pandemic was selling lunch at $5.95. When you think about how they could make money for a lunch for $5.95, when you take into account the cost of their food, labor, rent, um, electricity, gas, water, garbage, uh, insurance, I'm sure I'm missing something, real estate taxes, um, what, could, what could the profit be? Um, so the, the Chinatown business model has always been reliant on selling volume. They set a very, very low price, but they're hoping they're gonna sell 200 lunches, 300 lunches, and that's the way they squeak by. So when you have these rising prices because of inflation or energy costs are going up, um, it's so hard for these businesses. That restaurant that had the 595 lunch now has a 750 lunch. And the owner says to me, he's not making money. He also gives away the rice is complimentary and a bowl of soup. And he does it just to keep the doors open and hoping that the clients also come back for dinner. But their mindset is they want that inexpensive meal. Um, so there are a lot of challenges for Chinatown right now. And um, I think that um, it's, it's just, um, and as, as I mentioned before, we had the summer weather where, you know, there were more people out and about. And now as we enter the winter months, I'm really worried because when it's really cold in New York, you don't even wanna cross the street to get some orange juice. So that means that there's also going to be a greater decline in business for Chinatown too, and for Chinatowns all across the country. Right. It sounds like Chinatown is no stranger to, to crisis, um, but this is so much more sustained and long-term um, to, be, to be suffering this lower level of foot traffic and lower level of, of business that's really pushing things to the brink. Um, yeah. This... There's actually one more issue too, I'll say it again, there's actually one other issue that's very important and that is right now in New York City, they are talking about congestion um, pricing. So cars coming into New York will be charged a surcharge um, to enter the city and they haven't determined what that price is going to be. But I know that many businesses in Chinatown are very worried about this because it means that Chinese Americans, Asian Americans, or Americans in general who want to come into the city to visit Chinatown might not do it if it's gonna be $23, might not come into Chinatown just to have their kids get a haircut and to have a lunch of dim sum because everyone has to tighten their belts right now. So uh, there are multiple uh, challenges uh, facing Chinatown even though the pandemic is over. Mm -hmm. When we talk about preservation, I think a lot of people think that that focuses on the buildings. So I think this conversation is really interesting around the lifeblood and cultural assets of, of Chinatowns being the legacy businesses. Um, and I came across some words that you used in an article to describe kind of your journey before that really struck me where you said you realized you have always been a preservationist and your life's work has come into sharp focus. And I, I wanted to hear in your words, what does being a preservationist mean to you? My work as a Chinese cookbook author has always been about preserving uh, recipes that are at risk of being lost. I've always been fascinated with getting recipes from the older cooks because I think that there is so much wisdom in the old ways. And I've been so focused on uh, the traditions of wok cooking. 
But as the pandemic unfolded, as you said, I shifted my focus to saving Chinatowns. Um, and at first, it, it did not sink into me, but I realized that I was, of course, trying to save one of the great centers for Chinese cuisine and culture. But um, in fact, I am preserving a piece of the American story. And Chinese food is, has such a long history in America, which dates back to the mid 1800s. And there is this wonderful author, Jennifer A. Lee, who wrote a book called Fortune Cookie Chronicles. And in the book, she talks about the fact that we think of apple pie as being the quintessential uh, American food. But when was the last time you had apple pie? And when was the last time you had Chinese food? And for most people, they, they of course, eat Chinese food more than they have apple pie. Um, and if you Google what is the most popular ethnic food in America, it's Chinese food that comes up. And I think most people don't even think of it this way, but Chinese cuisine, Chinese food in America is an important part of the American culinary landscape. And so I've always thought about the fact that I'm preserving the traditions of Chinese culture. But in fact, now I realize that I'm preserving a piece of American history when I fight to save Chinatowns and Chinese mom and pop businesses in Chinatown or Malaysian, Vietnamese, there's a, a vast array of different Asian cuisines that you will find in Chinatown and all of them are part of the American story. That is so beautifully said. Thank you for that. Um, one conversation we had earlier as we were preparing for this session, um, you had brought up a common understanding of preservation that you you yourself held before we started talking, which is that uh, people often think that preservation is um, focuses on the distant past or the quote unquote long dead past. Um, and it's not really relevant to people today. And I wonder what could show communities like Chinatown that preservation is a tool for good. Well, um... I think that without preservation, there will be the loss of Chinatown as a way of life. And all those stores that I feel are so unique and special from the herb shops to, you can find artisanal tofu in Chinatown, um, bakeries, uh, there, there is so much richness in Chinatown. And here in Manhattan's Chinatown, you only have to look at Little Italy to understand what the ramifications are if we don't save Chinatown. Right now, Little Italy is just, it's a tourist, it's like Disneyland. The, the restaurants are geared for tourists. Um, there's only two remaining markets. It used to be a vital community and it's all been stripped away. And one of the things that uh, came up during the pandemic was in April of 2020, I read a CNN report that 59% of independently owned Chinese restaurants in America had ceased their credit card and debit card transactions, implying that they had permanently closed. And in the same uh, news piece, it said that P.F. Chang's, which is the largest chain of Chinese restaurants in this country, had received PPP loans and their sales had doubled. And at that time, I thought to myself, oh, my God, are we going to lose all the little mom and pop restaurants that have so much character and and make Chinese food so interesting in this country? And we are going to be left with the equivalent of the Olive Garden of Chinese food. And now, as I see Chinatown struggling, there, uh, there is a P.F. Chang's that opened in the financial district in 2020. There's another one opening up about like a mile or so from Chinatown. And I think there's another one like two miles away. So if we do not take action and actively 
preserve and support Chinatown, I fear that we will be left with just big chain restaurant, uh, Chinese food restaurants. Mm -hmm. Yes, it seems like so many Chinatowns are battling for their soul right now with commercial development and so much development pressure that's really changing. And they're also facing issues around razor thin margins and kind of inequities and in access to incentives and um, and other sources of public support because of issues like language barriers and um, and. and lack of translation and things like that. So thank you for sharing with us some of those some of those challenges. I want to end on um, a question about how people can act to save Chinatowns. What if if people walked away from the session today with one to do item, um, what would you say people can do to support their local Chinatowns and help um, and help their survival? Um, I think it's really important to make an active effort to support your local Chinatown um, frequently and not just to eat in the restaurants, but to shop in the markets and the stores. Um, and when I go to Chinatown, I ask my friends or my neighbors if there's anything I can pick up for them, some takeout, some uh Produce, uh, do you want the mangoes, the baby bok choy, some fresh ginger? I'm happy to do that for you because every little bit counts. And um, and to actively do less online shopping and to go into Chinatown and experience how wonderful it is to shop from these little mom and pops. And you can find everything in Chinatown. It's not just Asian ingredients. You can find milk, yogurt, you can buy paper towels. There's tons of pharmacies. You can get your uh, drug prescription filled in Chinatown. There's uh, in New York's Chinatown, there are a ton of eyeglass stores. Um, Chinatown is infinite in what it has to offer. And so I urge people to support their local Chinatown. And if you don't have a local Chinatown, uh, support your local AAPI mom and pop businesses because they've all been suffering during the pandemic or remind your friends and relatives who live in cities that do have Chinatowns that they need to show up. That is fantastic. And an absolute last question, what's next for you, Grace? And are there any exciting campaigns or projects in the pipeline that you would like to share? I'm partnering with the James Beard Foundation on a national social media campaign called hashtag support Chinatowns. And we are launching that November the 15th of this year. And we are reaching out to famous chefs and celebrities and we want them to share their Chinatown story. So many of us have um, a special love for Chinatown and tips for things that we love to eat or do in Chinatown. So we want to gather up those stories um, and memories as a tribute to Chinatown and to raise public awareness that uh, we can't take Chinatown for granted. And the idea is to have this outpouring of love and support for Chinatown um, and that it's a way to recognize that Chinatowns are an important part of American life. So I hope all of you will um, do a post about why you love Chinatown and a memory and use the hashtag save Chinatowns and in this way um, support Chinatown as best you can. Thank you so much, Grace. I'm really excited about this continued partnership to protect Chinatowns for future generations. Um, and I wanna thank the audience today for tuning in I also want everyone to know in terms of next steps for the National Trust, we are planning a series of convenings around Chinatowns over the next several months. So if you are viewing this, you are already part of the National Trust community and network. So we will be in touch soon for those interested on ways to be involved in future discussions and roundtables to join partners from around the country who are passionate about securing a thriving future for American Chinatowns and other AAPI communities. I will end on one of my favorite quotes from Grace, even though I can't possibly say it any better than she has said it during this session. But Chinatowns 
and the businesses within them are links to our past. And when we lose our past, we lose a part of ourselves. And that's why this work is so important. Thank you all again, and please enjoy the rest of the conference.